In this episode, I'm going to be talking about some crazy good things like some wild experiences I had this weekend. Should you use SGC versus PSA? The best cards I'm looking to buy right now and some amazing sports card strategy for the winter. And I've been using this strategy every single winter during the holidays for the past seven or eight years. And it works every single day time. If you don't know who I am, hi, my name is Eric Michael. I've sold over $5 million in sports cards. And four years ago, I started a coaching program teaching people how to make money with sports cards because I truly do think it is the simplest, most fun, realistic way to actually make an income online. And I've been so fortunate that I helped so many people at this point make an income with sports cards. And really, I would like to give myself credit, but it's really not much of me. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. Sports cards are just a pretty easy way to make some nice extra side cash. It's not that complicated. But I've been so fortunate where it's changed my life, and I've been so fortunate to help others change their life with sports cards. But let's get into some things. So the first thing I want to address is this is like the craziest thing I have seen yet. So if you follow me or have seen my ads or my YouTube videos or just anyone online, no matter how great of a teacher they are or if they're a total scam, you always get people that say, this guy's a scam, I hate this guy, whatever, right? And that's just the reality of internet marketing and the internet. You know, if someone doesn't like you, you can tell someone two plus two is four and they're still going to disagree, okay? That's just how people operate. There's an amazing book called How to Win Friends and Influence People that kind of addresses this concept. And basically, Dale Carnegie, who's a super famous public speaker that wrote that book, he says that you cannot win an argument, okay? Because if you win an argument, well, you pissed off the other person. And if you lose the argument, well, then you lose the argument. So there's no winning an argument. You have to come from their side and come from their angle and see it from their perspective and try to get them to see it from your perspective, right? It's a much smarter way of just going about life. It's kind of like trying to tell a Republican or a Democrat the opposite party is right. It'll just never work. It's just impossible, right? It's just a waste of time. So keep that in mind with what I'm about to say. So I had Dylan. So so there's someone named Dylan in my life. Dylan is the reason all this is possible. Dylan is the one who introduced me to sports cards back in 2015. And he called me the other day and he's like, hey, did you see that post about you? And to be quite frank, even though all my, right, obviously I post on social media a lot and my content's all over the place, I never go on social media. I keep myself out of social media. I use social media as a mechanism to get people into my world and teaching them how to make money with sports cards. But other than that, I don't like to scroll on social media. I think it's just addictive. And I always, if you've listened to anything I've ever said the past few years, I always say that I like to take all the time people spend on social media and apply it towards something productive, whether that be going to the gym or listening to podcasts or learning or business, whatever. So I keep myself off of social media. And Dylan's like, did you see that scam post about you? I was like, what? Oh, man. (laughs) What now? So this guy, I I forget his name. I mean, even if I remember his name, I'm not going to say it. But so someone, okay, this is a crazy thing. You have to understand the backstory. So we show people how to get something called a card finder. Okay. What a card finder is, it's an overseas virtual assistant. A virtual assistant is someone you could hire in the Philippines or India or Pakistan, one of these countries, but we use the Philippines and you can hire these people to do tasks for you for three to four to $5 an hour, which sounds like you're paying them low, but in the Philippines, three US dollars an hour is above minimum wage in their country. So it, the US dollar carries a lot of weight over there. So it's an amazing trade-off. Like I have over 10 of them that work in my business and I'm able to pay them, you know, like a thousand bucks a month and they're amazing workers. They speak perfect English and it's cheaper for me. And a lot of the time, honestly, they're better workers than Americans. And it's just, it's a win-win for everybody because a thousand US dollars in the Philippines goes a long way. And this guy accused me. Okay. I didn't fully understand what this said, but he accused me of getting virtual assistants, these card finders, we call them to make fake eBay accounts to drive up the prices of cards that either myself or my students are buying. I'm not sure if he was accusing me of doing it or my students of doing it or me teaching my students how to do it. I'm not exactly sure, to be honest with you. But something along the lines of 
I, either me or I teach people to get these virtual assistants. They make fake eBay accounts. They shill bid auctions. If you don't know what shill bid means, it just means you fake bid and then you never pay for the card, but the sale still shows up on eBay to drive up the prices. And there's just so many things wrong with this theory. Just, I was like, I, I can't, like, I get it when people like comment, Eric's a scam because he's teaching the wrong thing. You shouldn't be doing this. You should be doing that. That's just like a disagreement on opinion. But this is just so fundamentally wrong for so many reasons. I just felt the need to address it. I was like baffled when I saw it. I was like, there's not someone actually posted this. Like there's better things to say about me than this. But let me try to explain to you and show you something. Hold on. Let me see if I can pull this up. I should have, I should have had this pulled up before. All right. So what we do, so this is an old list. So I'm going to go here and share my screen and share this with you. So check this out. So this is how the card finders fundamentally work. So these card finders, or overseas virtual assistants, they go on eBay and they don't even have an eBay account. What they do is they find links of cards that they think are good purchases. So we show them how to find what cards are good deals and negotiate and how to look at the condition of the card, all the stuff I show and teach on my YouTube, we teach these card finders. They then go on eBay with, they don't even have an eBay account and they find cards they deem are worthy or, or they'll go on your eBay account and they'll put cards they think are solid purchases on a spreadsheet, just like this that you're seeing right here. And how it works is at the end of the day, instead of you spending two or three hours to find cards, well, here's a bunch of pot, this is an old spreadsheet, but these are po possible purchases you can buy and it takes you like five to 10 minutes to go through what your card finder found and you just outsource, you know, let's say three hours of work for $9 and they could find you 20 to 30 cards a lot of the time in that time for that time period. And it's great, right? They, the overseas virtual assistant makes money. You just outsource three hours of work for $9. You buy a few cards, you spend a few hundred dollars. And obviously if you do it right, you're going to make more than $9 in profit, hopefully, what you paid to the card finder. So that's how the whole card finder thing works. And I just want you guys to also understand this from a business perspective. So think about business and think about myself, for example, right? I'm not going to sit here and lie. I like money. You like money. I want to make as much money as humanly possible, right? Just like anybody, right? 99% of people can agree with me on that. And if You've ever seen like on YouTube, so actually someone just, I, I was going through my YouTube comments before this podcast because I like to answer the comments on this podcast and someone just commented that, how, like, so we posted like a testimonial of someone that made like, was making like five grand a month, I think in profit. And so he, this person commented, how much did you pay this guy to say this for you? <laughs> and uh, those comments are pretty frequent, but I want you to understand something from my perspective, okay? And I outlined this a few podcasts ago, but I'm going to outline it again because I think it's so important. And this relates to sports cards and business and just anything in general. So think about this, right? My goal, major league profits, I want to sell as much as possible and make as much money as possible, right? And let's say I have 10 people, right? I have 10 people here and each of them pay me $1,000 for my program. That's not how much it costs. I'm just giving you an example. So I make $10,000. And let's say out of those 10 people, Three out of 10 aren't good fits, aren't qualified. We, they probably shouldn't be in the program, but we sold them anyways, all right? Let's say on this hand, you have the same 10 people, but we only sold seven out of 10. We only sold the people that are actually qualified and will do well in the program. Well, on this hand, I made $10,000 right away. And on this hand, I only made $7,000. But the long-term effects of me only selling the right people into the program and only admitting people into, the, into my program that are gonna do well, well, what happens? On this hand, these three people that would have left bad reviews, never left bad reviews, and negativity, as you probably already know, spreads 10 times faster than positivity, right? Remember in high school when someone cheated on somebody? The whole high school found out about like, like that, but when someone volunteered for charity, no one gives a shit, right? It's just, it's just how it works. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's how it works. And what you come to find out is, so I, I have found this out from my own end. If we make seven people successful, and let's say we make seven people $3,000 a month, which is you know a nice little side income, maybe out of those seven, two to three, leave us a positive review and talk. When people are successful a lot of the time, like to keep it to themselves, they don't like to say it out loud. However, if you make three people 
if three people join your program and pay you money and they don't make any money, all three of them are leaving bad reviews, going on Facebook, leave, leaving bad reviews, bad posts, and because negativity spreads 10 times faster than positivity, right? You don't go on Yelp and leave a bad review or leave a good review for a restaurant a lot of the time if the, if the fish was great, but if the fish sucked, there's a much higher chance you're going to go on there and be like, fuck this, the fish sucked because you're pissed off, right? So that's why if you've ever like looked at my YouTube or anything, we have like a million good reviews and very few to bet to any bad ones because we truly only let people in the program that we think will be successful because me being selfish, I want to make as much money as possible. Now, I know the least or the least amount of negative reviews, I'm going to make the most amount of, po- amount of money possible in the long run. Going back to that guy that claimed that I was making, uh, having card finders make fake eBay accounts or something and drive up prices of sales. Think about that from my end, right? So Major League Profits is a multiple, multiple seven-figure company at this point. And think about how foolish that would be of me to risk myself like trying to drive up the prices of cards to make an extra like five to 10 to 15% on cards. To be quite frank with you, major league profits is most of my income. I buy and sell sports cards on the side. It still generates me like five, 10, 15, 20 grand a month profit, depending on the month and like how hard I go. But most of my income comes from major league profits at this point. And I would never do something to risk my reputation because doing something so foolish and stupid like that to make myself an extra few thousand dollars in a month maybe could possibly cost me hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars, right? So just coming from my own angle, that would be a just horrifically stupid financial move. Or if even if I was teaching that to students, same concept, right? If that word got out, the reputation of major league profits would be tarnished. And that's the only thing you can't fix a bad reputation. You could, but it takes a long, long time. And going back on that point, so I actually, so like, as you already know, watching this, or if you don't know, I'm going to tell you, sports cards is full of a bunch of sleazy people that maybe aren't the most ethical. It's just part of the game. It's just business in general, honestly. Business is a lot of people that just aren't ethical. Nothing you can do about it. That's just how humans are. Humans are greedy, right? And what people used to do, so I actually knew a few people that got caught up in doing this. And it's actually like a smart move if you think about it. Like if you want to be greedy and dirty and make a quick penny doing it the wrong way. So what people used to do is like this. I'm going to give you an example. Pretend you buy a bunch of Bobby Witt cards right now, okay? And let's say you buy each of them for $500 and you have 10 of them. So you spent $5,000 on cards. And let's say you hold them and you hold them till February. And now you want to go and sell them in February. What people used to do is they used to make fake eBay accounts or even really eBay accounts and they, that card of Bobby with it, they were buying for $500 back in, you know, now or October or November. What they used to do is people used to, and people still, I'm sure, do this. They would go and find these cards of Bobby Witt on eBay and buy them for seven or $800, knowing that even though, it's, 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 it's like a tricky dynamic, but because they're overpaying, for this card of Bobby Witt. Now, everyone thinks it's $700. So all those cards they bought for $500 a few months ago are now worth $700. So a lot of people used to do that and manipulate sales and manipulate comps. Me personally, I've never done that because there's just no need. There's more than enough money in sports cards without having to be sleazy. But is it ethical? Is it just smart business? I don't know. Personally, I think it's unethical to do that. You're really manipulating sales. But I know a bunch of people who used to do that, and I'm sure there's still a bunch of people that do do that. So I just wanted to address that because I was just like mind blown. And here's a nice little tactic, not tactic, but advice for you on social media. So I don't know if you've ever seen in these sports card Facebook groups or just any Facebook group, people get called out all the time. So for example, in sports cards, I see people get called out all the time for this person made me an offer. He never followed through, and he's a scammer, right? This stuff happens all the time. Here's a great piece of advice. Never go on Facebook and fight with people. You will never, ever, 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 ever convince someone you're right. You are purely wasting your time. You are fighting fire with fire. Take my word for it. Like, that post, wherever it was and whoever posted it, 
if I went in there and said exactly what I just said on this podcast, it wouldn't matter. There would be 10 people disputing that, oh, you're a piece of shit for this, this, and this reason. Oh, I have proof even though they don't. And what happens is you just added more fuel onto the fire. You can't win an argument on social media. Take my word for it, it's impossible. I've seen so many people get called out on social media for doing this and doing that. And they'll try to fight it in the comments. And it just ends up just, it's always just brutal because you're one person and people love to like gang up on people that are down and kick people while they're down. And you just get crushed. Okay, so if you ever get called out on social media for something, whether you did it or didn't do it, hopefully you didn't do it, but trust me, take my word for it, never fight it. You're only wasting your time. I've seen it too many times to count. <laughs> but I just wanted to address that because I thought that was interesting. All right, we got some questions here. Um, these are actually comments in my YouTube. So the Card Society, I like that name. So the Card Society says, ah, sorry, need a drink. So the Card Society says, any help with time management on finding cards to buy? Sorting through eBay is quite time consuming. That's a good question. I like that question. So there's, well, there's a few things. I don't know. So I'll paint both different scenarios. So if you are a beginner in sports cards, yes, it's going to be time consuming, okay? And I, I explain this to people all the time. So think about this. Let's say you just got into sports cards, right? And let's say you're looking to find cards that are raw, get them graded, buy them, flip them, et cetera. You're gonna suck. You've never done it before. You're gonna stink. I can promise you that. And on, just think about this, right? Here's a good analogy. Let's say I'm the best free throw shooter in the world. And I teach you how to shoot a free throw. I'm, I show you the part where your elbow should be, wrist action, how to grip the ball, everything. No matter how much I show you, and no matter how many videos you might watch of me on YouTube, you're gonna suck. Especially if you're in the beginning, I can promise you. But the way you get better, and Alex Hermosi, I love when he says this, is, is like, his, I don't know if it's a famous quote, but he says it all the time. You keep performing the action till you suck so little, you're eventually good. So you're gonna suck if you're in the beginning. It's gonna be time consuming. And just to kind of give you like a numbers example, cause I'm a math guy, let's say you suck right now and it takes you two hours to buy one card, okay. But as you keep doing it, you buy more cards, you get them graded, some do well, some don't, you figure out what's good, what's not good, you get better at looking at cards. Well, now you're buying one card every hour and a half, one card every hour. Eventually you're buying three cards an hour, four cards an hour. and that is how to get good at something, right? It's just repetition over and over and over again. And the problem in like modern society with like TikTok and Facebook and Instagram is people just need these delayed gratifications and they can't deal with that repetition over and over and over and over and over again because that's how to actually get good at something. And just to give you like a real life example from myself, like Major League Profits, like we weren't really profitable as a company for years but my business partner, I stuck at it, got really good at marketing and selling and helping people make money with sports cards. And it took years of over and over and over and over and over again. And then eventually it took, to be frank with you, it, we started Major League Profits in March of 2020 and not till January of 2024, like December of 23, right around then. That's when everything clicked. So that repetition is what you need. And Alex Hermosi talks about this all the time. So, right, you have, when you start something, let's say you start buying and selling sports cards, right, you have uninformed optimism, right? You're like, woo, like, this is the next great thing. Like, I'm super excited. I love sports. And then you go through what you're going through right now. You feel like buying and selling sports cards is so time consuming. And you just, it takes forever. And that's when you hit that lull. You hit that spot down in the graph over here where you feel like quitting, that's where most people quit. And what most people do is they're like, okay, sports cards isn't the answer, I'm going to buy and sell coins. And then the same thing's gonna happen again, right? You have this uninformed optimism, like woo, like this is amazing, and then you realize it's hard, and then you go back to this lull. But if you just stuck with it for a few more months, you would have eventually hit that informed optimism, where you actually see yourself make money, and you're informed on how to do it. But most people quit when they're down here before they ever get back up here, because it's like a graph. Uninformed optimism, you suck, 
and it feels like shit, and you're not making any progress, and then it goes up and up and up. Take an example from, besides Major League Profits, but an example you could literally actually see. So like my content, for example, on Instagram, if you go back, like way back, like way, way, way back to my reels, you'll see all my reels sucked. They all sucked, and my Instagram following barely grew for like two years or like three years because the reels I was putting out were just not good. It took me three years to realize I should be doing this podcast, and these this is the type of content people want to hear. People want to see me answer questions and show them how to literally buy and sell sports cards, and it took me years to realize that and years to get good at that content. I posted thousands of reels and pieces of content before ever realizing this is the type of content that sticks, and this is what people want to see, but right, I stuck with it while I was in that lull, and eventually I hit that place of informed optimism. So that's kind of how business works. So if you're a beginner, that's what I would say. Don't quit. It's supposed to suck. You're supposed to feel like shit. That's when most people quit. And that's why yourself, hopefully if you're listening to this, you're going to get ahead because you're going to stick with it and you're going to get to that point of informed optimism. And once you hit that point of informed optimism, well, then you could do kind of what I talked about before where that guy accused me of like shield bidding cards with card finders. You can hire someone overseas to do it yourself. Like buying and selling sports cards is really, once you get good at it, it's not that complicated. Like business in general is usually complicated, like owning a restaurant or pizza shop or major league profits or any of these full-on businesses are usually complicated. There's so many different moving parts and pieces, but sports cards is really relatively simple. And you could teach it to someone overseas. And the way to find these people, you can go to a website called upwork.com, U-P-W-O-R-K.com. And you just put a job posting. Hey, this is what I'm looking for. Three hours a day, you know, looking for someone to help me find sports cards. And if you think about it like this, right, because you're paying them $3 an hour, even if they're half as good as you, who cares? Because it's $3 an hour. You're outsourcing your time. And let's say, right, let's say, uh, this, let me think of an example here. Like, let's say in three hours, you could find five cards that are good, all right? But instead, your card finder in three hours finds two cards that are good. Who cares? Have the card finder work double to find the amount of cards you would if it's $3 an hour. Who cares? So I'm not sure where you're at, the card society, but that's the answer to your question. If you are, you know, in the beginning, like you're supposed to suck. What you just said is supposed to feel natural. Like stick with it. And then number two, if you're good at it and you've made some money, when I say good at it, you've made at least like 10 grand profit and you feel comfortable with the process of buying cards and flipping them, then I'll get a card finder. So Hopefully that makes sense. Um, all right. So Ka D Town Relics is a pretty broad question. People love these questions. Would you sell a Jordan Love Prism Rookie Blue Wave PSA 10 right now? So without even me looking at what it's worth, I'm sure it's worth like seven, eight hundred bucks. Yes. Okay. Because if you've followed anything I've ever said in the course of YouTube, my YouTube history or Instagram history, I don't like to rely on guessing. Who knows if Jordan Love is going to have a good year or not for the rest of the year? I don't know. Probably. I think he's a good quarterback, but I don't know. I think I'm going to take the um, Jaguars plus four. Actually, I need, keep me, I need to do my top three picks. I haven't done my top three picks for a little bit now because I've been so busy. But Jaguars plus four is going to be going to be a pick of mine. But I don't know if he's going to play well. Who knows? But I like to put my money in predictable situations. And from what I've seen, the most predictable way to make money in sports cards is buying in the off season, buying while it's low, and waiting for it to appreciate before the season. And number two, pairing that with grading cards. So that's like predictable money, right? This card of Jordan Love, right? We could, and we could look it up here. Let me share my screen and look this up. So like this card of Jordan Love, so you can see I was looking at it before this. So check this out, right? This PSA 10. So there's not a lot of sales, but the last sale was like $770. It's probably $700. Who knows? Who knows if it's going to go up or down, right? You don't want to guess on that. I mean, so me personally, to just be straightforward and answer your question, yes, I would sell it right now. Take that money, put it into Cards Raw, get them graded. I think personally, that's the best way to make money. So that's that. Um, uh, oh, this is another good question. So Greg C says, what do you think with Tatum? 
I see his cards are fairly low coming off a championship, and he's the face of the Celtics. I picked up his 2017 Optic Red-Yellow Variation Rated Rookie for $100, and it's already slabbed in a PSA 10. Well, if you got that graded, congratulations. Nice. Good for you. So, okay. So, like, this is my personal opinion. It's kind of similar to what I just said. Jason Tatum is a blue chip stock, okay? Could it double in value? Maybe. But probably not. It'll marginally go up or down 5 or 10%, and it's not really going to make you much. The money is much better spent in, like, flipping cards systematically. It's going to make you much more money. Jason, Jason Tatum is similar to... Let me think of an example. I don't want to say LeBron James because that's a bad example. Um, who's like a blue chip stock? Blue chip stock. Blue chip stock. Uh, I don't know. Is LeBron James the best example I can think of? I don't know. Like Jalen Brunson. Okay, let's take Jalen Brunson, who's been a solid player for years. His value is just going to eh, go up and down a little bit. People get excited and values double and things skyrocket with new, young, volatile guys. That's why, in my opinion, the best way to make money in sports cards is buying the young guys, the guys who you've never heard of. That's just because you're playing the swings, right? Like, unless you're buying a card to get a graded of Jason Tatum, which you should, and it's a great idea, outside of that, where's the money to be made if it's just going to, you know, stay put? Like, here, let's look it up, actually. So let's look it up. Tatum, silver, prison on PSA 10. Let's look at this. Hold on, let me, let me share my screen. Uh, all right, check this out. So what you're looking at here is a Jason Tatum silver prism PSA 10. And you can see it went up a little bit when he won the championship, and then it came back down. But you can see it's like pretty consistent, right? Like sales are like, for the most part, like around that 650, 700 range. There's just like not a lot of room to make money because he's a blue chip stock. So it kind of just stays even. And once again, anything could happen. Maybe he could have an MVP year and average 30 a game, and this could double. Who knows? But in my experience, it's probably not going to happen because at this point in Jason Tatum's career, right, he was a rookie in 2017. He's been in the league for seven years, which sounds crazy because he's still young. Is it going to go up much? Probably not. People people get excited and people dump money and overreact to the younger guys. So that, in my opinion, is a reason to not buy him unless you're buying raw to get graded. If you're buying raw to get graded, right, anything really goes. Um, let's see what other questions we got. Uh, um, Jeremy Hutchings says, I need to sign up and become a student, man. <laughs> I'm the worst to impulse buy, and I'm a huge fan of certain players and sports. I'm 50 years old. I've been collecting since I've been 10. I want to start making money. Thanks again for your videos. Well, I appreciate that. But yeah, that is the death of people when it comes to sports cards, impulse buying, because usually when you say impulse buying, you're buying like your favorite player or your favorite team, and just it's just not a good purchase. Like the classic impulse buyer does something like this. The NFL season's about to start. He's a Bears fan, and just people when they're a fan of a team convince themselves like Caleb Williams has to be the next greatest thing. There's no way he's not. They buy a bunch of Caleb Williams and it flops. Like not only are you doing sports cards the wrong way because most guys just go down in value when a season begins because that's what people do when they impulse buy. They buy players when they're hot. They buy players before a season starts, which is like the wrong way to do it in my opinion. And then number two, you're just buying your favorite player. Like there's nothing backing it. It's just your emotion. So it's usually just a terrible decision to do that. Um, and some other stuff. So going to the holidays. So this is some nice sports card strategy for the holidays. So let me break down to you how sports cards works during the holidays. By the way, Instagram Live, I see you. Sorry, I'm not, uh, I'm not ignoring you, I promise. Um, this is how sports cards works. Holidays happen. Black Friday, Christmas, sports card starts to go down because people put their money in other, sting, other things. Right? They put their money in presents and gifts and traveling and all that stuff. And the sports car market always takes a decline. November, December are like amazing times to buy cards. Just incredible times because you could buy things so cheap. People are opening up a lot of cases and boxes for the holidays. And you can just buy things so cheap and the market picks back up in about January. And if you buy cheap now in November, December, you buy cards to get graded. They come back to you in January and February. Right? You're playing that nice swing of the market down now while you're buying and it going up. So November, December is not a good time to sell cards, really any cards, to be honest with you. 
But buying, good. Good for buying. Um, so that's that. And let me look this up. I want to I go back to, uh, I want to give you my top three picks. I have them written down here. Um, all right. So these are my top three picks of the NFL. And I meant, I, I meant to do this for the past few weeks, but I've just been so, so busy. I forgot. And <laughs> these are, these are some funny, um, yeah, these are some funny games. These are some funny games. So pick number one, and this is going to sound terrible, <laughs> is the Cleveland Browns plus eight and a half to the Baltimore Ravens, home to the Baltimore Ravens. Those division games are just always close, man. They're always close, and the Browns are terrible. The Ravens are really good, but I just see the Browns covering. I, I just see it. That's pick number one. Pick number two, and this is also just equally just, I, I don't, you can tell I'm not that, this one I'm not that confident about. Same concept, Colts plus five home to the Texans. These are all one o'clock games. Same thing, division, a lot of points. The games are usually close. I think they played, or the Texans and Colts played in Indianapolis, and the game was really close. Um, that was in week one. And then number three, my this is my favorite pick of the week, and I know I'm going to get a lot of shit for this, but the Jaguars plus four and a half home to the Green Bay Packers. I think Trevor Lawrence and the Jaguars are playing well home. I just feel like it's a great spot at plus four and a half. It's a field goal game. Packers defense is okay, not amazing. Jaguars defense stinks. But I feel like Trevor Lawrence is turning a corner. Trevor Lawrence and Jordan Lover equal quarterbacks to me. Trevor Lawrence is home, plus four and a half. Doug Peterson's a decent coach. I'll just take the points and ride with it. I think it's going to be a field goal game. So those are my top three picks of the week. Um, and yeah, I think that's all I got for you guys today. I, I have a few other things to talk about, but I'll leave it to the next podcast because... I'm running out of time here, but hopefully you enjoyed this stuff. If you do enjoy this podcast, I put up another podcast a few days ago. I'll leave it around here somewhere where you could watch it. I always try to give as much value as possible, talk about my life, business, just fun stuff, anything that's happening. But if you like this stuff, like, comment, subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube, and I'll see you in the next one.